I would assume I know, recognise some faces there on my ambles round town on a Saturday morning. Um, welcome everybody. I'm, my name's uh, Paul Osborne. I'm chairman of the scrutiny committee. Um, so good evening. Welcome to this additional meeting of the Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Um, councillors and officers are reminded to put their mobile phones or electronic device on silent if they have one near them, not place papers or electronic devices between themselves and the microphones. Please with remote participants mute microphones when not speaking as this will reduce feedback and background noise. Members of the council join us remotely should leave cameras on. After each item has been presented, I will invite members present in the room to ask questions first. Those members join us remotely will then be invited to speak. They should indicate their wish to do so by the raise your hand facility. Only those members of the overview and scrutiny committee present in the room who are making the decisions I will confirm the result verbally for the benefit of those watching the webcast. Um, I should also welcome Mayor of Roy. Right, worshipful Mayor of Roy, as one previously myself. <laughs> and uh, I've asked him to sit at the table with us so that if there's any um, questions that he wishes to put, then he can do so after us. Okay. Um, item one apologies and substitutes or absence. Apologies for absence and substitutes. We have Councillor Mrs. Earl Williams. Um, Councillor Mrs Barnes is substituting. I also have apologies from Councillor Cook, the Vice Chairman, and she has been uh, substituted with Councillor Richard Thomas. That's it. Um, and also apologies from Head of Neighbourhood Services. And Head of Neighbourhood Services. Uh, item two, additional agenda items. There are none. Uh, item three, disclosure of interest. I would assume any county councillors because the land is actually the building... Is actually on County Council land. Personal interest, Chairman, as an executive member of East Sussex County Council. Okay. Um, so, on to agenda item four update from Freedom Leisure. I'll go to uh, Chief Executive Malcolm Johnson first for, for an update from our side, and then I'll move over to uh, Ivan Horsell Turner. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, I know you would, have said, you would have said it when you were introducing him, but welcome to Ivan tonight and, and, and his colleagues. I think it's just important just to say a few words and then I will hand over to Ivan. But the reason we're here tonight has been, an, it's, it's been sky high utility bills. And I think has seen that, whether it be at home um, or in business, you know, we really are seeing utility bills at a, at a level that haven't been seen for many, many years. Um, if anybody does a quick Google search on swimming pools and utility bills, you will find tale after tale of you know, swimming pools struggling. I would say it's also a sector that is, um, that is still recovering. And again, Ivan, I'm going to say Meg touch on this, but um, it's still recovering from co or the, you know, to get back to the levels it was at before COVID. So it's a difficult market. Um, if you remember during COVID, the government supported businesses with, with grants. Um, in this case, it's costs that are going up through the roof, not income dropping. Um, the government have offered some support, but I, you know, I think they're being pragmatic about it. We don't know how long this is going to continue. Nobody has, a, nobody has a blank checkbook or a checkbook that can go on forever. What we've done so far is to work closely, and I'm pleased to see the, the, the worship of the Mayor here tonight. We've tried to work with Right Time Council, with Freedom Leisure, um, to find a way forward in this matter, because that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're trying to achieve. So, if I may, Chair, if I hand over to Ivan, and then we can pick up any points after that. Thanks, Ivan. Good evening, everyone. Um, Louise, um, I'm going to if you don't mind, ask you to, to run through slides as we go. So I've got a presentation to go through across the next 20 minutes or so. Hopefully it will set out the context um, uh, and then obviously very happy between myself and my colleagues to take questions. So if we can move through to the second slide, Louise, which was simply to introduce my colleagues. Um, my colleagues... Sat Slides aren't quite, quite keeping up, but I'll carry on. The, the, my colleagues sat at the end of the table are Paul Doyle, who's our regional manager, and Toby Reid, who's our, our area manager for Hastings and Rother. Okay, on to the third slide, please. 
Thank you. Okay, so in terms of what I want to go through, I, w I want to set out that context a little bit. I want to talk to you a little bit about the, the sort of energy costs and those financial pressures. I think I think Malcolm sort of alluded to that already. A little bit about sort of discussions uh, uh, with the council, w w with your offices, uh, about what is your service, and, and I will keep keep referring to it as your service because we're quite clear that we are operating on your behalf in your service. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the financial impact of the, uh, 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 the closure and, uh, and other mitigations we've had to take across the Rover sites, so in the rest of the Rye site, but also in the two Bex Hill sites. Uh, the national picture, talk about pool closures or where, where, where pools are closed already and that developing pressure and some of the timelines uh, that, I, that I really see in terms of the cliff, cliff edge of, of pressure that really is building up. Um, talk about the sort of... Uh, where we are in terms of uh, energy support elsewhere and base management fees, uh, uh, and, and I, I think that, that explains some of the context of, of why Rai in this, this, this area. Um, political, media, sector engagement, what we're doing to, to, to try and absolutely make the case, and, and I will keep coming back, we are trying to absolutely trying to make the case on a governmental level that this is a sector that has been really disproportionately hit uh, by energy pressure, and it's a sector that absolutely will need support into, into next year. Um, uh, talk about how we can sort of review that temporary closure or, or, or the process for reviewing that temporary closure across the new year. And lastly, and, and fairly unashamedly, I, I'm going to actually turn this round a little bit and, and, and actually try and suggest some of the things that, um, that I think you as Rover members can do to assist. And um, if I may, given that uh, uh, we have colleagues from Rotan right Council as well, I, I may even be suggesting some of the things that I think you can do to, to assist because I think this is a, this is a shared problem uh, and we need a shared approach to it. Okay, so on to the next slide then, Louise. Um, to, to walk through that sort of context, as I say, I've already sort of identified it absolutely is, is the council service that we're operating for you. Uh, we've been operating the service since 2006. Freedom Leisure is a, is a genuine leisure trust, so we're, 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 we're absolutely, absolutely mandated that all we can do only over a period of time is reinvest surpluses back into our operation but that means we hold relatively low levels of surplus. So each and every year, and you feel free to go back through our accounts uh, with, the, with, with the Financial Conduct Authority, we don't hold large, large, large levels of reserves because we reinvest it back into the business. What we have here in Rover is, is two contracts. Slight mismatch in terms of timing. So we, we have a contract uh, here in Baxhell for, for the leisure centre and the leisure pool, which is, uh, which is valid until the end of March 24. So couple of years hence, or a year and a half hence, and the, co and the contract or, or partnership in Rye yeah, is valid until the end of March 2026. Mark talked about partnership approach and partnership approach to where we are now, but I think also a partnership approach to, 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 to the management of that service over, over all those years going back to 2006, and there has been a very good partnership, I believe, between Freedom Leisure and, um, and Rover, and it's, it's important that we actually maintain that partnership approach through this very challenging situation. And, that, and it's, that's really when, the, where, where, when partnership comes absolutely to the fore, when people are put under pressure, when there's challenges, and, and when people are hopefully act in a, a coordinated, coherent and, uh, and positive manner. And, 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 and for me, that's absolutely where we are. We need, we need a mutual understanding of the challenges, understanding of the, the challenges that we have in, in terms of viability, but absolutely equally an understanding of of some of the absolute pressures on Rover and, and what's affordable for you. So this isn't about this isn't about pointing blame backwards and forwards. I said to someone earlier on, it was actually a, actually an MP for Wrexham I was on the phone to earlier on the, the, early on today. I was saying that this isn't about blaming each other. If we want to blame anyone, we can all blame Vladimir Putin. We can all blame the, the impact that, that, that the, the, the war in Ukraine has had on energy prices. However, somehow we have to deal with the consequences of it. Um, and the last point I'm going to make, and that's fairly obvious, is, is this discrete meeting. It's a public meeting. I, I'm not sure that beyond uh, members of right hand council, there are too many, uh, too, too many public, uh, members of the public here. But we, we have to make sure that the, that the discussion we have is appropriate for that context. And clearly there will be some things that I, that I will have to be somewhat circumspect about saying and answering if anyone wants to get into particular details of the financial situation. So... Uh, we can only answer so much in a public forum, this is, this is the point I'd make. Next slide, please. Okay, so a little bit of background in terms of energy costs. Um, 
Where we've been as a business is uh, we've been in a fixed three-year contract for both gas and electricity. Um, uh, the gas was fixed until the 1st of October, just gone, and the electricity was fixed to the 1st of November. Um, utility prices actually started moving last, last autumn, um, um, at which point we, we began to advise clients, including Rover, of, 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 the, of the situation. Very much a theoretical issue at that stage because we were... A year away from a year away from it actually meaning anything to us, but you could see the wholesale price of utilities beginning to move last autumn. It of course moved much more dramatically in January and February after the sort of build up of, uh, of Russian forces on, on the Ukraine border, and then then obviously going into Ukraine in, in February. So, absolutely huge eye watering um, uh, changes in gas and electricity prices ever since that stage. So I've made the point about the, 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 the end dates. Um, just to give you that kind of context and organisational context for, 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 for the pressure this creates within Freedom Leisure, but within, within a variety of organisations, what we had was an energy bill as a business of some £8 million. And where we are now, and that's with the caps in place, it is an energy bill of, of broadly £20 million in a 12-month period. So that's an increase of over a £1 million a month. I've already said that as a genuine ledger trust, we make very, very small surpluses. Um, perhaps to give you a context for that, because it is public information, you can look up our accounts. In a good year, pre-COVID, I have to say, good year, we might have made a couple of million pounds of surplus that we were then reinvested back into the business. So you can see a change in cost basis, a seismic shift in cost base of, of £12 million pounds just isn't something that's, that's affordable and doable without significant action and change uh, within the business. Just to kind of drill that down to a little bit more uh, uh, more locally, uh, the, that increase in, in Rice Sports Centre would be some £92,000, and indeed the increase across Rover would have been £277,000. So big numbers, and, and you can see the pressure that that, that inevitably creates. Um, in terms of the, uh, the, the government support we have, it's the government support that, that all businesses have currently. So it's the Energy Bill Relief Scheme. Um, it's only in place until the end of March next year. Um, and thereafter, there's a review um, in terms of any forward uh, uh, support beyond that. And that's a review, around, a review around the vulnerable sectors. And I will keep coming back to, within this presentation, and probably within any questions you've got, just saying that, for me, the absolutely key issue is making the case to try and get it get us identified as a vulnerable sector post the first of April, to, 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 to have that support carry on uh, during the, during the, the next financial year. Next slide, please. Okay, um, having talked about the sort of pressures coming from the energy costs, and again, I think Malcolm alluded to some of this. Um, uh, we're a sector, public sector leisure, uh, a, a, a sector really under pressure anyway. And that is around that incomplete income recovery from COVID. So while some areas of the, the business have bounced back, bounced back quite well, the kind of engine of the business across the piece has largely been memberships, and that used to make up some 50% of our, of our income. And that income stream is only recovered to between 80 and 85% of its pre-COVID levels. So incomplete income recovery causing pressure on, on, on the sector and on the business. And then, of course, we are also suffering from, um, from, from, from the, 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 the really high inflation, uh, so the highest inflation for 40 years. That impacts the rest of our cost base. So we've got the utility piece, but that in, in, impacts the staffing and all the other costs. But, of course, that highest inflation also impacts consumer spending, discretionary spending. People haven't got to come to leisure centres. And so that cost of living crisis absolutely potentially impacts uh, that further income recovery. So add that to the energy, you begin to see the kind of pressure that the industry and the sector is under. OK, I'm just going to sort of march through this fairly quickly, uh, but just to kind of illustrate the point that, that this is something that's kind of developed over a long period of time. But whilst it's developed over a long period of time, it's become critical much more recently. And it started from a, from a relatively theoretical perspective, so back last autumn, um, we were absolutely aware, as I've said already, energy prices were beginning to go up. We covered that 
as a note, as 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 as, as, as a risk within within the uh, six monthly board meeting we, we had we had with yourselves, um, uh, and you know, at that point it was this is what's happening, this is the price in the wholesale market. We're locked in to fix prices for the next twelve months, so we haven't got an immediate problem, but there could be a problem at that stage. Move on six months again. We're still identifying it. And then it begins to get more and more serious and we walk through a whole process. And this is with, with all of our clients, not just with Rubber, with the whole 25 clients across the, across the country of sending out letters to them in May, sending out a further letter to them um, in, in August, absolutely kind of making, that, making the point as to where we're getting to. And that it was moving from purely a theoretical position that energy prices look really bad now, but hopefully they'll have, they'll have settled down by the autumn too running out of time for them to settle down, and they absolutely <coughs> didn't settle down or didn't settle down to the extent that, 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 that would have been needed to return to our previous cost base. Um, so you, you kind of run through that process. Um, I've made the note there that on the 8th of September, I can remember it very well because it was actually also, uh, as many of you will, will also know, it was the day the Queen died. <coughs> on the 8th of September, Liz Truss who was briefly Prime Minister, apparently, um, uh, stood up... In, oh, that's, actually, she didn't. It was quasi quite wasn't it? Stood up in Parliament and, and announced that the Energy Bill uh, 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 bill Relief Scheme would be put in place. There, then, because of the passing of the Queen, there actually wasn't any detail provided as to what that meant until kind of the middle of September. So we knew something was in place there. Um, we didn't know what it was. We didn't know how significant it was. But we absolutely knew that the, the wholesale prices were quite significant. At the back end of that, in the middle of September, um, we were advised by, by yourselves, by your officers, that, that, that there wouldn't be, that it wasn't possible for uh, financial support from, from, from Rava. Clearly, you've been through sort of internal processes to, to reach that position. Next slide, please. And so that begins to move into, into the decision. I'm trying to give a, a context for this decision and, and just to make sure that everyone understands that it doesn't it didn't come completely out of the blue, but obviously it did come quite rapidly at the end of the process, and that's because some it, it, it suddenly became very, very real with knowledge of what that energy bill relief was, that it wasn't anywhere near enough support, and indeed obviously knowledge of the council's position in terms of the support that you were able to give. So we Walk through sort of a meeting with with, with, with your chief is that with Malcolm end of September, um, confirming that without support we had to do something very significant to begin to mitigate that two hundred and seventy seven thousand pounds worth of pressure in rubber. And what could we do to mitigate that? We'd obviously done all of our internal analysis as to as to what things we could do, and the biggest and biggest uh, element of that was obviously. To, or would have been to, to shut Rice Swimming Pool. And again, I'm, I'm happy to come back to, to why Rye, not Bexhill, but it, it's fairly self evident given the very different levels of, of usage and income between the two facilities. But that was, was absolutely necessary to help us close some of that gap, along with a range of other things that we needed to do. The reality is that the, the range of all those things won't close all that gap and will still make a significant loss on, on, on across, across the two contracts. So I wrote to, to, to Malcolm on the second, confirming that position. Um, obviously, again, more internal processes from yourselves. Um, and on the 12th of, of October, we got to a position where, uh, where it was appropriate for uh, customer and staff com comms to, to continue. That was actually, instead of the same day as the Energy Bill Relief Scheme actually was improved in, in, uh, approved in Parliament, and, and therefore we knew exactly what it was going to be. I have to say, I've made the comment there, blunt and insufficient support. It is blunt because it applies to all businesses. Some businesses that don't need it, some businesses that aren't significant users of utilities, whereas we're a sector that are huge users of, uh, uh, of utilities and, and absolutely a sector that, that, that need it because we're a very low margin sector. Um, and then obviously the, the temporary closure of the pool began on the 1st of November. That's just kind of a little, a quick walk through the sort of history or the sort of timeline of it. Next slide, please, Louise. Okay. Um, so, 
And again, this sort of talks a little bit to, 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 to why Rye not, not, not Bexhill. But, but, but essentially, closing Rye, which, although a much loved facility and, and has got strong community, um, uh, strong community value, doesn't, didn't have the throughput, the, the, uh, the, the, the income that Bexhill did. And so, in closing Rye, the foregone income is less than the saving in the utilities and staffing costs. So we're obviously not collecting the income from using that facility, but we're saving staffing costs and we're saving utilities. And across the, across the winter, across the five months, we're calculating that at about £12,000 per month. Obviously, you don't really know in advance. We are only really about to tell in, in hindsight. But, but, but certainly the utility savings, we can absolutely see. We can see the staff savings. The, the income, I suppose, relates to previous years. So there's about £12,000 per month of saving uh, by keeping that facility shut for this winter period. Uh, I have to say we're still forecast to lose approximately £80,000 in Rye this year. So it, 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 doesn't, it, it doesn't take away that problem, but it does significantly mitigate that problem. In terms of where we are with that facility, the, and, and I know this was a question that we were asked early on, absolutely the water's been kept in that facility <coughs> on, a, on a minimum level of circulation and, and potentially heating should it get very, very cold. We're doing that to protect the integrity of the building, to protect the integrity of the pool. If this was simply about maximising and optimising the saving, there are further things we could and should do, including taking the water out. But what, what we've done is we, tr we sought to achieve that balance between achieving some operational savings, safeguarding the facility, and making it possible to reactivate that facility reasonably quickly, should that be where we get to. So I think we've taken a, a prudent and sensible view through that. Uh, next slide, please, Lewis. Just very briefly to mention some other measures across the district, and I don't really want to and need to dwell on this because I realise the purpose of this meeting is fundamentally about Rye and Rye Swimming Pool. But, as I've said, the, the scope of the extra costs or the extra pressure on us is some £277,000. Quite clearly... Uh, the saving of maybe £12,000 a, pounds a month in, in Rye doesn't get anywhere close to offsetting that. So there are a range of other things that we've had to do, uh, both within the, the dry site in, 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 in Rye, but also within the two sites in Rother. Having said that, absolutely, within the dry site in Rye, we are doing all we can to optimise income, just as we are at two Bex Hill sites, because obviously optimising income is absolutely part and parcel of, of what we need to do to to get as close as we possibly can uh, to, to making this work. Um, there's some range of bits and pieces in there. I'd obviously draw your attention to something such as the, uh, all of the, uh, the implementation of, uh, of all of our energy non-negotiables, which are, are some really kind of, uh, really sort of tight management to try and, to try and achieve uh, energy savings that, that we need to, to, to help, help make this work. Quite a lot of reviewing of, uh, of sessions, of times, Reviewing of staffing, and you know that the reality is that, that that we're having to do all we can, both within Rye, within Rover, and within the business, to, uh, uh, to to really bear down hard on our costs. In terms of within the business, just a couple of corporate measures I've, I've highlighted up there as well, uh, just so you can kind of see this isn't this isn't all about uh, just the operation. Absolutely, um, we've had to take out some. I think it's 19 members of head office staff. We don't have a huge head office staff, but um, uh, we've removed some 19 members of head office staff, uh, which will save us something like £700,000 into next year, because this isn't an issue that's going to be solved across the next few months. This is the environment we're, we're, we're absolutely in. And indeed, um, uh, myself and the, the rest of the senior team have, have taken uh, uh, a reduction in pay uh, again to help make this balance. Um, I've been asked the question, and will be asked the question, I'm sure, about sort of other pool closures. And uh, as Malcolm says, if you, if, if you kind of if you go on Google, go on go onto the the web, you'll begin to find an increasing number of uh, of articles and stories of pressure in different areas. Um, I have to say that pressure yet hasn't resulted in a huge number of closures. It has resulted in some, but not a huge number yet. And I think that's in part, that's, that, that's a timing thing. So 
there's a timing issue in terms of when, when people end up finishing on their fixed term deals. So just as domestically, some people are currently exposed to, to the market and protected by the cap, but some people might be on a previous fix. Absolutely the case in terms of across the market as well. So it's, it's about the contract renewal dates. It's also about the support that local authorities have been able to provide to, to their operations. Um, it's also about the underlying um, viability and usage of, of facilities. So, so I, I think there's probably been a little bit of a stay of execution across this winter. Uh, my view, for what it's worth, is there's that last bullet point on this slide, that there's absolutely a cliff edge coming in January uh, when we should learn from the government whether we're going to get that vulnerable status for the 1st of April. Uh, absolutely need to get that status if we can. If we don't get that status, then I, I think there will be a significant number of closures up and down, down the country. So on the slide, I've given some examples of, uh, uh, of non-freedom leisure uh, closures, so Ringma um, across in Lewis, uh, Deepings in Lincoln, uh, one in Litchfield, one in Cornwall, and a couple in, in Gateshead. So, so some, not that huge number yet, and there are others, uh, uh, or quite a lot now, which are getting some support. But again, I think that support is, is largely temporary. So I'll talk in a little bit about the support we're getting. The support we're getting elsewhere is about this year. We haven't as yet got very much support into next year. So again, I think you know, Malcolm's point about not knowing how long this is going to last and, and what the pressure is, it's absolutely the case. Uh, I'm noting the one there in, in, in terms of Richmond because it, it potentially was quite um, quite interesting. Um, uh, Richmond is, is Richmond, Yorkshire. Uh, it's the Prime Minister's constituency. And uh, there absolutely was a, set, a suggestion that Richmond Leisure Centre uh, was likely to close. Uh, so uh, run, by, run by Richmond Leisure Trust, a very small leisure trust that literally just, just runs, runs facilities in, in that district council. Um, there was quite a lot of newspaper noise that that, that that might be the case. And indeed, they actually, on the 1st of November, actually featured as part of that BBC um, article that was, was on Rye as well. Um, they have now actually achieved support from the District Council. So I'm not going to say anything, but, but, but I don't know if there was a little bit of political pressure there, because I can imagine that would have been highly embarrassing for a facility to, to actually shut in the Prime Minister's constituency. But that's kind of where we, where we are. So, so, so some are getting support, some aren't. But as I say, my, my view is that, 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 that uh, leading into and beyond January could be really quite crucial for the sector. Um, just to give you the kind of context of, of kind of where where we are, and I, I kind of need to, if I can circle back to that point I was making in the first slide and the point Mike, Malcolm made beforehand. This is absolutely, from my perspective, about partnership. Absolutely not blaming, not not for, for me to blame Rover District Council, not for Rover District Council or even Right Hand Council. Hopefully to blame us. This is about dealing with the circumstance in front of us. So where I'm providing information here in terms of the support we're getting elsewhere, it's within the context of that, therefore, has probably resulted in some different outcomes. That's not me saying it's not right that you, you, haven't, you haven't been able to support, support us because, obviously, the circumstances in Rover are the circumstances in Rover. You've gone through whatever decisions you have. So I just want to be absolutely clear that I'm not, not in any way... Um, uh, well, suggest the only blame there. But just to give you that kind of summary of where we're at, we've got 25 partnerships across the country. Uh, 12, of us, 12 of those partnerships uh, have been able to provide financial support this year. That totals some £2.5 million pounds worth of, of support this year, um, which eats some way into the, some of the considerable sums that, 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 that we have, uh, have to cover in terms of this, this eye-watering increase in energy costs. Uh, we've still got uh, a further five uh, authorities uh, who have got reports going up to their members in, 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 in the next few weeks uh, with recommendations for some support. So obviously I'm hopeful that, uh, that all of, or at least many of those, will get across the line. We've got four of our partnerships where we've actually got energy benchmarking or responsibility with the council contractually, so we're not exposed to that increase in, 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 um, in energy costs. So they've taken tariff risks for us contractually uh, from the start. And we have, we have four authorities, um, uh, such as yourself, where we've had uh, confirmation that, that, that you've not been able to provide support. So that, again, that's just to give you the kind of, kind of context of, of, of where we are. 
There's another little bit of context here, and I probably I should make the same disclaimer, not trying to, to throw brickbats in any way, but I'm trying to set the context because then we then have to work through what it actually means in terms of how we can go forward. Um, the context here is, is the, the so Rye Leisure Centre um, is, is in a small, relatively small rural population. Um, it's 5,000, I can't read it the way I've got it printed out. It's a small population, some 5,000 uh, people. Um, we've provided from elsewhere in our estate, so we've got 108 facilities. I've, I've dug out some examples of other wet and dry, so other sw swimming pools and dry centres in smaller communities. Um, dug out where we are contractually in terms of base management, please. So this, this is nothing to do with the energy relief. This is where we are contractually. And all of those facilities have a management fee paid to us. Now, it's, it's not always comparing eggs with eggs, or apples with apples even, um, because each of those facilities is different. But again, just to give kind of a little bit of an illustration that we're starting from a position that Rice Sports Centre is probably difficult to manage economically in a relatively small community, and to manage that without public support was a challenge before, before the energy crisis. Now, with the energy crisis as it is, um, is, is, what, is what makes it sort of you know, really unachievable to, 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 to manage that facility without something giving. Um, so, back to the sort of the key issue for me, which is absolutely getting that vulnerable status across the line beyond the 1st of April. <coughs> um, lots of political engagement. Um, as I said, I was on the um, on a call today with uh, uh, the the MP for for, for, for Wrexham. I engage with as many as I can. Um, clearly, locally, both Sally Ann Hart and Hugh Merriman both very aware of this issue. I've had meetings with them, or a combination of physical and virtual meetings with them. Um, they've been suggesting or, or, let it, or saying to me that, 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 that they're actually going to raise the issue within government, as have almost all of the other MPs I've spoken to. So I'm kind of reassured that, that, that they're aware of it. Whether that's actually going to translate into, in, into something or not is really hard to tell. Um, I absolutely believe there's a case that it should do, but, but equally I accept that, that, the, 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 that with the overall pressure on public finances... The government is only going to support so much energy support beyond the 1st of April for business. Come back to where they are now is very blunt. It's actually quite expensive because it's supporting everyone. I made the observation to, to one MP, as you remain nameless, that actually currently if you're in the headquarters of, of BP or, or Shell, you get the same, fundamentally the same support as we currently get because, because your, your energy support on your gas and, and electric is, is tariff-based and it's not either needs-based in terms of whether you're making a profit or not, or needs-based in terms of the level of usage you have. So it's a very blunt instrument currently. By making it much more targeted, I'm hopeful that they, they will have more resource, and that more resource, I believe, should be identified as, as appropriate for public sector leisure. Next slide, please. Media engagement. I think um, they normally say you get 15 minutes of fame, don't they? And I've had more than my 15 minutes, and I really would genuinely have liked, wanted it to have been for something a whole lot more positive than, than having to talk about the, the really perilous um, position that, that the sector, the industry, um, our organisation with 5,000 employees has been placed in. But that's where we are. And so we've been doing all we can to, to raise this issue. Um, you can see sort of kind of what we've been through in terms of regional radio, national radio, some regional and national TV. Um, and indeed, uh, there, there's, there's uh, another uh, uh, engagement on the, um, uh, uh, on the 8th of December with, on Radio 2 as well. Doing all we can to absolutely make that case and making that case across the next couple of weeks is going to be crucial because uh, if the government hit their target, which is letting us know in January 
where we're going to be in terms of support beyond April, I think the next couple of weeks, two, three, four weeks, are going to be essential in forming that decision. Uh, just to broaden that a little bit more about sort of sector engagement and some of these anagrams may not mean much to all of you. Uh, Community Leisure UK is the, the body of trusts, of leisure trusts uh, across the country. Um, I think it's uh, I think it's about 80 uh, leisure trusts in it, uh, right down from those small individual authority ones, such as Richmond Leisure Trust that I mentioned earlier on, up to ourselves and, and, uh, and Greenwich Leisure Limited, who are, who are much bigger national operators but are still leisure trusts. So we've been making the case within Community Leisure UK, Swim England, Swim Wales, UK Active, Sport England, Sport Wales, and across that sort of peer group of, of national operators to try and maximise the, uh, uh, the noise we're making, frankly, uh, about the importance of, of dealing with this issue. Okay, so in terms of the temporary closure of RIPOR, where we are currently is that the pool is closed until the end of March. Um, that, as I've kind of consistently said, the key element is, is finding out where we're going to be in that government review. Um, we need to see a better level of support in that review, if at all possible, than currently. And the reason we need to see a better level of support is, is those numbers I gave you earlier on, and I'm going to stick to the, the corporate ones because they're the ones I know best, what was an £8 million bill, with that support has become a £20 million bill. So even the continuation of that support still puts a million pounds worth of pressure on us. So ideally I'd like to see a greater level of support. We're making that, that very, very, very clear as well. Um, the revenue funding may be necessary in order to open that pool. Uh, revenue funding may be ne necessary in addition to that government support. So at the current level it doesn't that support isn't enough, so if, if we were to get an extension of that support and be able to somehow work through some revenue funding, then that might, might enable us to open. Um, but revenue funding would be absolutely essential if there were no government support. It, it just simply wouldn't work otherwise. Excuse me, should that not be 31st of March 23? You're absolutely right. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if, that, if that's the only typo I've made on this presentation, I, I, I'll be flabbergasted. But, but thank you, you're absolutely right. Um, so revenue support. Uh, the other bit is, of course, falling wholesale prices. You know, falling wholesale prices, and, and they have fallen a little, but they've got an awfully long way to go. They're still well above the cap, for example, and as I'm making the point that the cap is unaffordable, the cap is still three times, what, or two and a half to three times what we were paying. But falling... Falling wholesale prices would absolutely help. Um, where else could we be? We're having a look at, uh, at some solar PV. Um, but, uh, some investment in, in energy management can help. It'll only make a proportionate difference. So just to give you, to throw some numbers in there. Solar PV might reduce our bills by, by up to 20%. But as I say, they've gone up two and a half to three times what they were. So it, it's taking some of the cost away, but it doesn't sort the problem out. Um, where we're getting to is, is some, obviously some, some, some scenario planning. I almost couldn't say that. Some scenario planning, um, which will be in place sort of probably by the, certainly by the end of, end of January, early February. Uh, and that timescale is partly about making sure that we know exactly where we are from the government point of view. Uh, for dialogue with Robert District Council on their service on options for their service post the 1st of April. Uh, and indeed, in parallel with that, uh, I'm in discussions with... with, with uh, I don't know whether Will's a representative of Right, right Home Council, but certainly he's, he's someone that, that, that has been identified via Right Home Council who, are, who I'm working with, uh, again, to, to kind of inform that position. OK. You'll be pleased this is my last slide. Um, I say I, I recognise this is slightly cheeky, but but I, I guess it's where we are. Is, is is kind of what can what can all of you do to help this to help this situation? Because there won't be a single person in this room that doesn't want rice. Well, I don't think there'll be a single person in this room that doesn't want rice swimming pool to open. So we've all got the, the same objective. If you kind of understood what I've said in the context and the challenges, then hopefully you'll understand that. That, that something fairly significant has to change to make that affordable. And 
the most significant element of that, or the bit that I think I, gives us a fighting chance or kills us off, frankly, is around is around that government support. Um, and so, what I would want <coughs> from you, as as, uh, 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 as 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 rubber members and right hand council members, is, is to use whatever whatever links you have, whatever political connections you have, to make sure that case is made into government to make sure that case is made into, into public health where possible, so that public health can, are, can, can absolutely advocate the need for leisure facilities to be open, to deliver really good preventative public health, um, to make that case where you can through, through media and press, and to be supportive of, uh, of that need, of the need to keep the facilities open if we can. So that's the kind of the big ask. Um, there's probably a bigger ask in the next bit. The next bit, and, um, and uh, uh, Malcolm will probably kill me for saying this, but I will say it because it's the right context. I recognise all of the challenges, but to open that pool, I do think it needs, it, it, it's going to need some, some public subsidy. And you know, we just have to move to a position of, 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 of accepting that we've got a facility in a relatively small community that to be able to deliver that, that, that service it needs some subsidy. Whether that's subsidy from right, Robert District Council, Right Town Council, or where it is, but it's going to need, it's almost inevitably going to need some subsidy. It certainly will if there's no government support, because otherwise there's just no way it will open. And then the last point on that slide, I think I've already covered, is about some, some targeted uh, investment in energy management. And I know we've already been working with the council about an option for some, 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 some PV or solar thermal on the roof of the facility. As I've already said, it, it would help improve things, it would improve the viability of the facility, but of itself it doesn't get us to a position of saying the facility can open and would be viable. It just makes it more viable if and when we get to that decision. Thank you. I, that's, that's all I've well, got to say, but I'm very happy to have any questions. Okay, you want to turn your machine off? Thank you. Good. Um, Thanks, Ivan. That's, um, there's a lot of information there to take in um, for members and public, but it's, uh, it's, it's good that you've got it out there and uh, it shows the position that you've, you've, you've found yourself in. But sort of looking on, as I would, sort of following it sort of closely on, on uh, you know, comments on, on various Facebook pages and everything else, uh, which you know, some, some are relevant, some aren't. Um, and other sort of things in your presentation. One thing that sort of is a slight concern to me is there's only three years left on, on your contract to run the pool. Would you, would you be, would you extend that? Would you take a new contract? Would you walk away? I know that's a difficult thing to ask, sort of, to be honest, but, but what, what we've got to look at from, from a council's point of view is, um, if you're going to make an investment in, in solar PV, solar thermal and everything else, that's going to be over a number of years to get your payback um, and to keep the place open and, 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 and sort of more cost effective. But that's sort of, to a degree, difficult if there's no one there to run it. Um, also, um, you know, concerns have been raised that the opening times uh, post-COVID have been reduced. Um, does that yeah, I know. Obviously, you've you've got sort of a less, you know, you see your usage is down sort of eighty to eighty five percent from from pre COVID. Um, so people haven't sort of come back to it, and maybe they've sort of decided that to go for a walk is is an easier option, or or ride a bike rather than go swimming. But would would sort of reduced opening hours uh, affect people coming back? You know, I know a chap who I work with sometimes, and he swimming for years to, to sort of keep himself supple, he's a builder similar to me. And uh, all of a sudden the next, I was on a job, and he's, he's turned up at nine o'clock in the morning. So I said, what gives, Phil? And he said, well, swimming pool don't open till eight. He said, I used to go down at seven, and I'd be at work for eight o'clock. He said, but they don't open till eight, eight now, so I had to have me hour, so I, I, I won't stop for dinner. And I'll give you an extra half hour at the end of the day. So, so it, it worked for him, but, um, you yeah. know, it, it didn't, it didn't, if you know what I mean. So if, if that puts off other people, is, is, does that sort of perpetuate, you know, 
less use. I know the biggest killer is, is obviously is, is obviously the power and, 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 the, and the juice, but um, you know, is, does that does a less opening hours sort of perpetuate less opening hours equals less usage equals less income equals you know, and you're sort of slightly downhill spiral. And I think uh, a couple of weeks ago you suggested that the um, leisure centre had reduced opening times as well. I had emails from from a, a youth football team um, complaining that you know their 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 cubs their, their sort of junior junior footballers couldn't couldn't sort of train in the winter as they had done for many years because she was going to close on a Sunday. And obviously you listen to, to concerns there and, and reverse reverse that. But you know that looks to me as if we're sort of on a I won't say a downward spiral because that's, that sounds bad, but it, you know the, the less you know what I mean. The less you know, if you don't open the door, no one comes in, so you you haven't got enough money to open the door tomorrow. It's like a shop, isn't it? If the shop's not open, you can't sell anything. The fact no one turns up doesn't matter. Um, it's, it's sort of a similar thing. So that's just a couple of points I've got. If you want to sort of try and answer that, and I'll put it out to members. Yeah, happy to try. So in terms of the, the, the first point, um, where we are is, is some uh, just over three years at Rye and just over one year to Flex Hill sites. Um, would we take an extension at Rye in the current circumstances? This will surprise no one. Or no, not in the current circumstances. <coughs> Something would need to change to make it viable, to make it workable. But the reality is, whoever you put in there, whoever operated that facility, would would need something to change to make it viable. So there's, there's an essentially a viability issue. So happy to, you know, we could talk through the, how that could work with your, your officers. Uh, ultimately, if you were putting an investment in there, a, uh, an investment in terms of solar, solar, uh, solar firm or solar, solar PV, You'd want to be sure that there was an operator in during that period of time, um, whether that was the same operator or whether you know you were prepared to go for a changing operator uh, midway through that. Possibly isn't the end of the world, but you do need to be clear about the viability of that facility for the appropriate length of time. Payback on on, on, on solar solar PV is probably getting on for for four or five years to, to make it really work. So so. Um, <laughs> You just need that certainty of op operation. Really difficult to come to that at the moment. So <coughs> contracts that are out uh, are present and being procured are all being procured with the local authorities taking responsibility for the tariff. So that tariff risk is sitting with the local authorities in current contracts, co contracts that are currently being procured. Um, so I, I think to, to, to extend that contract at this stage, we'd need some sort of protection or reassurance around that. Happy, happy to talk if it's appropriate. Um, in terms of your comment on opening hours, yeah, it, it's, it's a really difficult one, that one is, isn't it? Yeah, and yeah, I absolutely agree. We, we have to be open to generate income. To some extent, the less we're open, the less income we generate. Having said that, fighting against all of that is to try and achieve the best commercial position we can. And so we, you know, we're, we've made what we hope were the appropriate judgments, but Having said that, no judgment is ever set in stone. We can review things at, at any time, and uh, as you know, as you just just demonstrated, we did reduce the hours on closing the pool a bit further. Um, yes, there was there was some uh, uh, community uh, feedback, shall we say? Um, we, we, we have we, we reversed that position, uh, and I think actually we're we're actually reasonably satisfied and that, that actually reversing that position was absolutely. Appropriate, and that we are we are actually generating a bit more footfall in those hours than, than, than we feared we might, and therefore it's been the right thing to do. But uh, it's always a judgment, and it's a difficult judgment. And like any of these things, everyone will have a have a different opinion. Um, uh, ultimately, ultimately, we're charged, or the team are charged with, with doing the best they can, and it is that that balance between absolutely wanting to deliver a service and a service for the community, because that's that's what we do. That's you know, As a charitable leisure trust, that's all we do. It's about delivering for the service. But overlaying on all of that is this big financial spectre currently we've got where um, 
some miserable WhatsApp, probably me, in head office is saying, we need to bear down on cost guys. You know, we need to do. So it's a difficult judgment to make. Yeah, and I think I'm, just a quick one. I, I, all people are saying, you know, you can run the swimming pool cooler. But I think there's a balance, there's a tight, tight balance between it. Then if the building gets too warm, it, it goes all condensation and then you get grief. Um, so the, the, the worry I have, and I know that when it was uh, constructed, was as soon as the, the pool was in place, it was filled up because it's got a high water table where it sits. So, so sort of a, a, one of your notes there said, uh, you know, potentially drain the pool. I, 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 I would be concerned at that, to say the least. <laughs> But there it is. Um, members, I'll go to Councillor Maynard first. Thank you very much, Chairman, and thank you very much indeed for, for coming along this evening. I mean, I certainly make no apologies for asking you to come along and speak to the Scrutiny Committee because here, rather, it did seem to a lot of members, especially those that weren't part of the administration or even those that were on the Scrutiny Committee, that a decision was made that wasn't, as you've lined up out in your, in, in your slides, that wasn't made following a paper to council with options. It was made, um, and, I, and I make apologies for saying it, but, you know, the decision was made in private and then an announcement was made. And I think that is what has, frankly, enraged a lot of the public, not just in Rye, but of course, it, and you made reference in your presentation, I have to say, as if it was just uh, for residents of Rye, quite clearly this is... Um, the newest leisure facility we have within Rother, and I'm sure that people outside of Rother and inside of Rother, within quite a large catchment area, um, use um, the, the, the Rye Centre. What I'd like to know is, in terms of, um, through you, Chairman, if I may, in terms of um, the, the business model since COVID, uh, how the, t the, the different sites in Rother actually compare, because you alluded to the fact that Rye... Perhaps I think I don't think I'm putting words in your mouth through you, Chairman, to say that Rye hasn't recovered perhaps as quickly as Bexhill in terms of the, through, the, the, the throughput, um, or has it always been the case that in terms of the profitability, I use the word profitability loosely, quite clearly, but in terms of, of the business model for Rye, um, clearly, I guess, has always been somewhat more difficult than, than, than the, the two Bexhill sites. But it's, it's trying to understand of how far behind we are in terms of of, if you like, capacity, we are within Rye, the, the Rye site, and, and how we could improve that. That, that would be the first, the first question. Secondly, I'll just make the, the overall comment that also, obviously what you don't want is a group of people in the room this evening trying to tell you how to operate your business model or you how to operationally um, change a number of things. Quite clearly, I'm, I'm guessing that pragmatic suggestions are, are probably quite fair, but none of us in this room would be an expert in how to operate a leisure facility or indeed a leisure pool. But it does seem to me, as, as, as the Chairman's alluded to, the problem is the long-term sustainability, the long-term uh, um, viability of the leisure offer within Rother and indeed elsewhere across the country. There, there are similar problems, obviously, in, in different local authority areas. But in terms of the competition that's out there, clearly... In terms of wet facilities, you haven't got any wet, surprise, surprise, we've said it many times before, you're, you haven't got any, uh, a, a huge amount of wet competition within, within the district. But in terms of, obviously, the dry offer, you've got gyms per popping up right, left and centre for various different reasons you could talk about privately. But, but the reality is the, 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 the dry offer within Rother, I think, is, is obviously a, a combination of public, private sector, whereas the wet offer, there are, I think, just two or three other... Uh, serious players in the market, but they don't offer the level of facilities that I think the wet offers within your um, environments actually actually um, attract the public in, a, in, a, in that way. But I guess my fundamental would be longer term, and I've said it before, and I make no apologies for raising it again, it's not a big P political comment, but it is simply stating fact. Our leisure facilities are ageing, and we cannot blame the operator, if you like, for the fact that as we go forward, they become less attractive if you don't actually put some serious public investment 
into those buildings because they need to be attractive for people to want to come and use them. And, uh, and it has to be said that the Rye Leisure Pool, whilst it was lovely and shiny and new back in 2001, isn't now. And this is why I've banged on time and time again that we need sensible investment in leisure within Rother. And, and some of that, inevitably, I think, despite what others may say, will have to come from this authority. Because if we're going to offer decent wet facilities, that's exactly what we're going to have to do. In terms of the specifics of how we've got here, I'm very pleased, Chairman, that we've seen that timeline so that not only members around the table, but members of the public watching this webcast, indeed, members of, of Rye Town Council can now see that timeline. Without asking anything that is contract sensitive, and I, I make that comment genuinely, can I just be clear that you, in terms of keeping the pool open, you did ask rather for a specific figure, did you, to keep that pool open? I just want to know that without asking anything, as I say, that's contractually sensitive. So I just want to understand the, concept, the, the context of those conversations that weren't had in the public domain. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Ivan, Ivan will answer the, the, the figure, will, will give you the figure. It was some 90, was it? I can't remember. It was about 90,000, give, give or take, but that 90, 92,000. Um, can I just put a bit of backdrop to that figure? We also have another premises in the, in the, in the district that has seen its utility bills go up this year from 80,000 to 360,000. So add that on to the 90,000. Add on a few other budgetary pressures that we've got there. 90,000 increase in RDC's own utility costs in the, over the next year. Half a million pounds of inflationary uh, costs to bring in. Um, that's already on top of targeting about two million pounds of saving over the next couple of years. So that's the backdrop to it. That was the reason why we agreed to a temporary closure. If it comes to a permanent closure, or if it's anything else, Councillor Maynard is quite right. That would have to come here with options as to what members wanted to do. But I would say, and our, our Chief Finance Officer isn't here this evening, but he will be saying, OK, what are you going to stop? What other services are you not going to do to deliver it? Because nobody is bailing us out. There is nobody for us to go to, to actually get more money. We've been quite clearly told, we'll probably, we haven't been put in these terms, but we estimate we'll be lucky to get what we got last year. With inflation running in the way it is, that is a significant cut already in our budget that we still need to take account of. So I would just remind members, nobody is bailing us out. Nobody's coming along with a magic money pot anywhere in this. Yeah, I think it's probably just as well that Tony Baden, the finance officer, is not here this evening. <laughs> he would probably have fell off his chair by now. Uh, when, when a, a request for funding was made. But uh, he, he obviously, he, he's, uh, well, hopefully he's not watching it either because <laughs> it'll be coming across his desk tomorrow, I'm sure. Um, Councillor Mooney. Thank you, Chairman. It is quite clear from what we've heard that Rye Pool is not economically viable. There isn't enough footwork to the pool. And of course, for something to happen like what has happened with energy costs, it brought it to its knees. And it's not surprising. Um, when the pool opened way back, the, it was envisaged that because it was going to be used by the school, and together with the school and the local community, it would stand a chance. But I'm afraid that's not happening. So um, I can understand why um, the plug had to be pulled. The only problem I have is that, yes, um, it took a while to come to terms with it, but why weren't we, why weren't the report brought to council to us to hear? Um, way back in March 2020, 2020 well, in 21, really. Uh, we, I think we gave you some money during the period to keep you ticking over. 
but you didn't bring anything with us because really we would probably, in all fairness, have been sympathetic. We would have done, well, we probably not, we could have done much about it, but at least we would have known. But it, it, as Councilor Maynard said, it did come as a shock to us all. Thank you very much. I think to be fair, Councillor, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure, someone might correct me, but I'm pretty sure most of the primary schools have used the book and the secondary school as well. I'm pretty sure they have. There is a joint user agreement with it. Um, I'm going to confirm that. Yeah, happy to confirm that. And I shall, I shall look at Toby for, for, for a nod as to whether I got the number right. I believe it's some nine primary schools. <coughs> Yeah, so nine primary schools and secondary schools. So, so there is some use, um, absolutely. Would we like more? Yes, yes, quite clearly. But, 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 but there has been some, some, some school use, uh, and um, there was school use right up to the point of it, of, it, of the facility closing. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, I'll go Councillor Cortell and then Councillor Clark. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and many thanks to Mr. Horsfall Tedder. Um, giving us a very thorough and very clear presentation. Um, um, my understanding is that the uh, SIL, that's the Community Infrastructure Levy uh, Panel of this Council, is likely to be looking at the possibility of installing uh, solar panels and other um, thermal possibilities. Um, at Rye Swimming Pool and I, I'm not an engineer but my um, understanding is that this is likely to result in um, the full energy costs of the pool being covered. Um, if that were the case would that solve uh, your financial problem concerning viability? I think I'll, I'll bring Ben in on this one, but I would I think uh, Ivan has mentioned a couple of times you know, a, a decent amount of thermal and, and solar PV would probably cover 20% of the cost. It might be more, um, but, uh, but Ben can cover that off. Yeah, I think it's important to note that we are doing some initial study work on this. I mean, at, at this point... We've had some information come through from a, an organisation called Energise Sussex Coast who have been really helpful to us in sort of identifying the options going forward. This is uh, work being undertaken by Elise Manning, who is our uh, environment, uh, environment project officer. I would say it's still in the early stages uh, at, at this stage. You know, we, we haven't done any structural surveys to see how, how and what would be supportive. We know on baseline figures that the... Um, <clears throat> That the generated power would probably exceed the electricity used in the in the, in the facility, but of course the main proponent of the, of the the energy issue is the gas that heats that, that does the heating system for both the pool and the general air heating system. So you'd be looking at some infrastructure requirements there. No application has been made to the sill panel yet for regarding any sill uh, requirements, and that's because we're still in the feasibility phase, looking at what options are available and how we take that forward. But of course, we'll, we'll keep members fully involved in that process as and when that comes forward. I think it's worth noting, Councillor, that the, uh, the SIL money that has been, been put aside is a figure of some 600,000, 650,000 maybe, um, which is being used, um, or hopefully will be used, towards energy saving measures in most of the village halls so it covers the whole district which is an idea that came from this committee originally um, so hopefully not only the Rypool but obviously the, the Battle Leisure Centre and the Bexhill Leisure Centre will also need the same issues will be will be there as well with, with, with juices. The electric and gas hasn't just gone up in Rye, it's gone up across the entire country, probably up our know, entire continent, to be honest. Um, so, so that'll be that'll be looked at. Um, I believe there's a seal. There is a seal meeting coming up. I think a week, a week Friday on the eighth, seventh, eighth, or ninth of December, whichever day it is. It's a Friday. Um, so, 
Sorry to interrupt you, Jay. Yes, there is a SIL panel coming up. It's probably unlikely we can give the SIL panel the, enough detail to make it a, a decision on it. But what we would like from the SIL panel is a decision in principle that if we can make a scheme work, then they will be prepared to allocate money. Because I think you know, the important bit is to get well, what actually can we put on there. But also, I think we need to go back a stage, and it's about looking at we need to ensure there's going to be a pool there. So that's going to require more than just some, some environmental work. And that's why I think it's important that we work with Rye Town Council and other local groups with, you know, that Rye Town Council no doubt work with to make sure that what we do is ensure the viability of the pool. And then we can look at what measures do we need to do to help that. And I mean, I think probably the worst bit at the minute for anybody is the uncertainty. I mean, nobody knows what's going to happen to costs. And that's the bit that is going to cripple a lot of businesses. Even if you could accept it's going to stay at a level for six months, a year, you can make informed decisions on that. What you can't do is make informed decisions when we don't know what's going to happen. And what is clear, but even through all of this, is, and there's, I would hate to say there's a silver lining because it's not a silver lining, but anything that we can do to reduce our um, reliance on fossil fuels can only be a good thing as we move forward, both environmentally for no other reason, but also because we do at least remove one of the uncertainties in the, in the, in the whole process. So what we'll be looking for from the SIL panel is a sort of acknowledgement in principle that it's a project they would be interested in, providing obviously we can get the detail and get, get, get something that's backed up. Thanks, Chair. Yep. Okay, um, good. Uh, Councillor Clark. Thanks, Chair. Um, when I was a young man, I was brought up in the village of Beckley, which is not all that far from Rye. And um, when you look at the catchment area around Rye, there are a lot of villages. But one of the problems is there's very poor bus services. So anybody in the villages who wants to access services in Rye, it's pretty difficult, and that doesn't help your business at all. Um, I was looking at the figures, a bit more background. You were saying the Roy Pool was losing around about 80,000 a year. Was that figure based on increased fuel costs in the last 12 months plus utilities? And was the Roy Pool pre COVID viable or breaking even? I'm trying to look at a normal scenario and look at where we are now. Because <coughs> If those figures can't be addressed of £80,000 loss, then I really can't see how you can ever make that viable. Thank you. Yeah, happy to pick that up. Uh, the £80,000 is the, the deficit that we will still have at Rye this year, even with the pool shut. So, so that's not the, not the normal trading position. That's the trading position this year with the pool shut, albeit with the increased utility costs on the dry side of the facility. Um, in terms of the kind of previous viability of the site, no, it, it, the honest truth is, is that site's struggled. Um, and uh, I guess if I go back to pre-2016, uh, we, we were in receipt of a management fee for it. At that point of 2016, a new contract, it was let on a concession basis, which was with nil management fee. That worked in as much as, so there's two contracts here, Bexhill, Two sites and Rye. That worked in as much as the Bexhill contract produced a surplus that's largely underwritten that Rye position. Um, you've now, of course, got a situation whereby there's pressure across the board. Um, the Bexhill contracts are struggling, but 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 are much closer to viability than the Rye, con Rye, Rye partnership that isn't. So you haven't got that same offsetting effect that that you had in the past. I've got two councillor barns, so I better, better, uh, you, you better, better, um, better, you better, you, you better, <laughs> I'll go for Mary first. Thank you, Chairman, a wise choice. Um, I'd like to ask a little bit about um, being proactive. Um, we've heard a lot about the dreadfully bad news that you gave us. Um, but can I just ask a little bit, you, you, you mentioned... Um, <clears throat> thanks to the cost of living crisis, people, your members, uh, you lost members. Does that imply that you run a kind of club 
um, in order to to get people in. Um, because I think most of us who've ever had anything to do with running a charity would, would, would be looking um, at ways in which you could quickly redeem the situation by trying to market and get people in to come and help. Yeah. Um, and I just wondered whether perhaps you've tried the NHS because, you know, we need to have people keeping fit, whether sports clubs um, who, for example, would come and play water polo. I, I mean, I have no idea of the size of the pool. Um, but what have you actually done um, to act, you know, to help things along? I, I'm, I'm, you know, I don't want to be too inquisitive about this, but it would be useful just to know what, what measures you and your staff have taken to try and increase um, pe or, or try and persuade people to come back. For example, when all those members left, did you ask them why? Did you, ask them, did you say, well, maybe if I can give you some sort of concession, would you consider coming back? You know, that's the sort of thing that I'd be looking for. I just wondered if that had happened. Okay, I, I, I'm going to start by sort of explaining the sort of basis of the use of the facility. And then I'm going to pass on to Toby, who, as I said at the outset, is the area manager and is much closer to what specifically we've been doing uh, in Rye across, across the past year or so, but, and indeed what specifically we've done since the pool shut. But just to start with the, the kind of in principle, bit, you asked about the sort of membership. Membership is just a, a payment mechanism. So we have a range of facilities, the fitness room, the squash courts, the main hall, and, and of course the swimming pool. And uh, they're open, all open to all members of the public, um, but they can choose how they choose to pay for that, whether they want to pay for that on a sessional basis yeah. or whether they want to pay for that on a monthly basis for a direct debit or an annual basis. So membership is, 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 a, is just a label, but it is just a type of payment method. Toby, can you talk a little bit about some of the activities that we've, done at, we've been doing at Rye to, to, to try and promote use? Perhaps particularly pick up that sort of point around sort of health referrals and what have you. Okay, so um, <clears throat> within the Rye product, we looked at the different options available to the community. So um, we ran uh, health referral schemes, so people who've been referred by their GP to come to the gym. Um, we also um, increased the scope of the, the youth membership, so 11 to 18. So basically, we gave them concessionary rate to come in. And we also gave an over 65 membership, which is a concessionary again to try and get the older generation to come and use the facility. Um, with the health, with the GP referral, we also gave them an exit. So once they'd done their um, referral in the gym, they then could take out a health membership, which meant they could still access the facility and the pool to actually keep, um, keep going on their fitness journey. Um, with regards to general marketing, um, we've obviously pushed different offers on memberships, as you would do normally, um, different pricing points for the swimming pool, but also for the dry side, so main hall higher, uh, the mugger higher, so the Astro outside as well. Um, and we also um, revamped the catering offering, so they've got the coffee machine in, to try and make it more of an experience rather than just basically a gym facility. Again, adding something to the product to keep people in the building. I think I think with the with the uh, the health aspect, I could look at both councillors Barnes here because you're connected with one health authority type thing, and you're connected with another health authority type thing. So that's I think in 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 the in the intro and the and the slides it said you know we need we need a way into the health authority. So there you go, <laughs> Barnes measures both. <laughs> One uh, pincer the movement. I'll, I'll go to you, Council. Yeah, I think, Chairman, it probably falls more in my uh, bailiwick because I represent rather only as an observer, I'm afraid, not a voting member on the Health and Wellbeing Board. We don't have a voting member. Um, certainly, I think it ought to be raised there. Um, this is one of these ghastly things about the public sector where the savings accrue in the hospital and yet the investment has to be made elsewhere by primary care and all the local authority. Um, 
So talking to the CCG is probably quite important. Um, and talking about part of the discharge process, if you've had an operation swimming, is a jolly good way of putting you back on your feet. Um, so both sides of the health service really ought to be interested in investing money uh, as well as the local authority. I'm struck also by the fact that this is much more than a swimming pool, and I'm not quite sure what the impact of closing the swimming pool will have on the other facilities. Uh, but let me leave that on one side. Um, the chief executive said something which I take leave to slightly question. Uh, he talks about uncertainty. There are certain certainties about the situation going forward uh, which are helpful. Uh, one is that the price of solar energy is coming down radically year on year. Um, so that if you actually invested in photovoltaic or solar panels, um, you would not only save your cost, but you would probably also be able to export to the grid. The problem with uh, trying to decide on any one facility about the pattern of energy is it's not stable. Uh, you tend to be able to export energy in the summer and have to import it in the winter. So a deal with the national grid is probably quite essential. Um, but it, it's quite an interesting one, I think, to talk about solar. We might also want to talk about heat pumps, because I'm not quite clear how much space there is around uh, the swimming pool. Uh, but ground source heat pumps or air source uh, can be quite good for heating water. And there's a third possibility, obviously, although at the moment I think it would be far too expensive. Um, it's hydrogen replacing gas. Um, and that is beginning to have some quite interesting uh, cost reductions. I noticed, for example, that hydrogen buses are now a lot cheaper than diesel buses, um, which is quite a, a unique uh, move forward. This is the work of... Uh, J.C. Bamford's work in Ireland, uh, which, interesting article, yesterday's Sunday Times, I think it was, Business News, um, on that, which is well worth consulting. I wanted to ask one or two questions about well, the same line, I think, as Councillor Clark. Um, I'd like to get my head round the break-even point. I looked at the uh, comparators up there and I noticed that the two that are much smaller than the catchment area of Rye, uh, one had a management fee of 150k plus, uh, the other was rather small, around about 60 or 70k plus, I think. I may have misread that figure, it may have been slightly higher. Uh, but it was quite interesting. I think it would be helpful, I'm not necessarily asking for it tonight, but I think if uh, Ivan could follow up uh, tonight by actually looking at what the pre-COVID situation was in Rye, level of membership, what the actual running costs were. Um, we're told there was a degree of cost subsidization from Bexhill, which was profitable, uh, so presumably there is some kind of point, tipping point, at which a size of population or a size of user force does actually tip the balance. It won't be absolutely accurate, it'll be a range, because your costs are going to vary, uh, depending on the age of the building and various other things. So it's going to be rough estimates, but it will give us some idea of what size of population we would need and what size of subsidy you might need uh, to actually keep uh, the facility going. And I don't know, maybe the local manager can tell us. 
how crucial the swimming pool was uh, to the other users, or were they not an overlapping group, were they disparate users, disjointed users? Because uh, clearly Rye couldn't afford to lose its uh, physical facilities altogether, um, even if it lost the swimming pool. But I wouldn't want to see the swimming pool for obvious reasons to go down. We are a coastal authority. We do have drownings. Uh, we have some quite dangerous currents <coughs> off both Bexhill and at Camber. Uh, you have a fast flowing river at Rye. There are good reasons to teach the kids to swim. And there are good health reasons why actually with an aging population, uh, we might well want to see the health authority, it's now a health partnership, um, invest in that. If they can do it, it would save the money in the long run. Uh, but of course, the long run um, is always something that nobody thinks about very easily. Uh, but some of those figures, I think, will be helpful to this committee. In more normal times, I, I think at the moment with energy costs uh, soaring, there is a very strong case uh, for getting out of the uh, business of gas as soon as possible. Um, if we can do it through solar, uh, well and good. If not, I think I would recommend looking at hydrogen if you're looking at a long-term investment scheme um, because the cost of that is likely to come down cost of gas is likely, I think, as usage reduces to actually go up to those few people who still uh, use it. But I think there's more certainty about the energy future on renewables uh, than there is in general at this moment. Yeah, I think, I think the cost of solar, so, uh, yeah, uh, EVs, um, not EVs, uh, Photovoltaics, currently about about twelve hundred pound a kilowatt. That's what it costs. Um, mine, mine for the for the record, made three kilowatts today, so I made about forty five p. If I feed it back in, <laughs> well, I might, I might have saved myself a pound, but it's certainly wasn't enough to run my house for the day. Um, is there any answers there you can you or, or your your chaps can give to John now if? I'm happy to, 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 to wait. I mean, I, I think you make a, a very, very fair point in terms of terms of kind of that under, overall understanding, that overall understanding of of, of 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 where it needs to be. That's the options appraisal that we'll be going through with with, with, with officers in the council uh, in January. We're working through with uh, with the, the colleague from Rye Town Council as well. Essentially, and I no, please don't believe this is being too simplistic, but but a facility of that nature in normal times probably needs subsidy. It had subsidy by virtue of the Bexhill sites. The Bexhill sites are not able to provide that subsidy, and then you overlay the energy costs on top of it. It is just trying to cover. That gap. So, so your question on on, on break even, um, I don't think I don't think you're about to uh, to build enough houses, enough chimney pots over there for, for that to be the the driver of it. Um, it is a question of priority, and it's really difficult. And as Malcolm's identified, you've got lots of lots of varying priorities uh, uh, um, uh, as an authority, um, but. The fundamental costs of running a swimming pool. I think someone earlier on was talking about there not being. I think it was you, Councillor Maynard. There not being much competition in terms of swimming pools. Well, the answer is they're not viable, which is why no one commercially builds them. Um, uh, so that the fundamental issue is there's been a seismic change of costs of operating these facilities. That cost changes utilities. It's reduction in usage through through through, through the, the outcome of the pandemic, and it's then massive escalation on it and inflation that means there probably needs to be public subsidy for a greater range of facilities than there currently are. Within the table, within what I've reported, you saw a whole load of other facilities where we did have public subsidy. It's a balance across across my portfolio of 108 sites 
we have some facilities that are subsidised and sub some facilities that, 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 that their operating income exceeds their operating expenditure and therefore they're able to actually to make a small return to the authority. The reality is the site of the nature of, of Rye is in the former category, not in the latter category. I'll bring in... Uh, I think, Chairman, what I was after was to try to get some kind of range of figure uh, for the subsidy that would be needed at Rye. Uh, clearly, to some extent, some of the other facilities may already have been subsidising the swimming pool, but we must have some idea how much uh, cross subsidisation was going on between Bakes Hill and Rye. It would be useful to have at least a range of figure there, um, a max and a min, which would give us something to go on. Okay, uh, Malcolm. Thanks, Chairman. I, I think you know, a lot of points have been made so far this evening, but one of the questions I think we have to address in due course is for a, if I may call it a community leisure centre with a pool in it, is the operating model that we currently have the right model as you take it forward? Um, you know, in, in the light of what may be a very different world we go into, Hence again, I keep, you know, that's why we want to work with Rye Town Council and with Freedom Leisure to assess that and to look at, well, if it isn't the right model, what is the right model? Because I must admit, as it stands today, I don't have a bright idea for you that says, this is the way forward, this will, this will solve all our problems. You know, we, do need to, we do need to address that. Um, and that needs to be part of the discussions we have in moving forward about dealing with that. And, and, and one comment I think I should make, because uh, and Ivan has said I'll threaten to kill him, he'll probably do the same with me with this one, but is bear in mind part of the reason that local authorities contracted out was to de-risk contracts. So it, was, it meant that the risk sat with the contractor, which is fine whenever things are fairly normal. But I have to say I have never, ever, ever known a contractor who said things are fairly good at the minute, I'm going to give you some money back. Yeah, that's never, never happened. So I think, but these are extreme circumstances we're dealing with. We're not dealing with just above inflationary pressures. We're not dealing with something that we know, we know for certain will be over in April of next year. Um, we're dealing with something where we don't know when it will be over. So I think what we need to do is use this time to have a look to see what can we do so that we can present a full report to members saying, here are the options going forward, and here are the agreed options, having, having talked to colleagues in, in, in Rye Town Council and, and dealt with that, so that we can go forward with a common approach. But to be absolutely clear, my aim is to reopen that swimming pool. That is what I have been trying to do. Whether I can achieve that, sadly, is not in my hands. It's not in Ivan's hands. It's not... It's not in, in a lot of our hands, but that is what we are working on. That's what we will continue to work on. I know Andy's perfectly capable of speaking for himself on this matter, but I know the commitment that Rye Town Council have shown uh, to this project. And we share that common goal. But we will have to come back with, with options because something has got to change. And it depends what's got to change as to what it looks like going forward. Thank you, Chair. Well, with that, Andy, Mr Mayor, if you wish to uh, speak to us. Thank you, Mr Chair. Oh, that was too loud. Um, first of all, thank you for um, allowing me to sit on the, uh, uh, the table this evening and um, welcome all the guys from Rye, from Rye for uh, their support as well. I don't think anybody's going to argue against the figures that Ivan's thrown up there this evening. Um, it, it's, it's obviously obvious that we don't have the turnover in Rye as Bex Hill has. But there's other things that we have to look at here. Um, first of all, for the people in Rye that do struggle to get to Bex Hill or to another centre, what's being looked at for actually uh, helping them achieve their, that goal? So the, the people that struggle with health and well-being that use the centre on a regular basis they now have nothing. They don't have that, somebody quoted earlier, that the public transport, although Pat does a wonderful job, public transport from Rye 
probably isn't quite what the people need to get to Bexhill or to other pools. Now, they've just been left out on a limb at the moment. Um, the other side of it is that we mentioned earlier that the, um, the schools were, and the academies were involved. They are. They're all, we, I spoke to the headmaster of the school yesterday, and he was saying that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but year seven have a legal requirement to learn to swim, to have. They've lost that. What has been put in place for them children, them, that year seven, to be transported and lost several more hours to get to wherever, which makes it a legal requirement for teaching them to swim. And then you've got the health and well-being and so on. Um, I've got a hundred questions, and I know my guys behind me have as well, but just to cut it short, and I know Ivan has suggested that we can speak later on certain issues that we have. Um, three questions here is, how does Rother District Council monitor contracts? Is one question that's been asked. Um, and then what are the reporting proceeds uh, that contractors have to adhere to? And we're going back where we've only had short notice on this pool being closed. That we don't see as, that's not a good thing. This should have been reported 12 months ago to give us more time to even get to a point where it didn't need to close in November, if that was the case. But we had no time. And the people of Rye are so up in arms about it. The last thing, the last question I'm going to come up just with this evening is that what are the details that Freedom Leisure break clause relating to Rye Pool? So what are the details of Freedom Leisure to have a break clause as far as their lease goes on Rye Pool? If I can leave them to you, thank you. If you can turn your machine off. Um, who wants that, Ben? Yeah, go on. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and Mr. Chairman. Um, the, so in terms of the contract monitoring, we have quarterly meetings with the senior managers at uh, Freedom Leisure, which covers the uh, activity both in marketing, uh, loss and gains in, in membership, etc., over the three, three, three sites that they run on our behalf. So those are, those are managed by the Head of Service for Neighbourhood Services. I myself attend probably once or twice a year to, to make sure that I'm, I'm kept in that loop as well. To be fair to... Um, um, and just to reiterate what Ivan said, that, that you know, early warnings were, were sort of raised, but there's such uncertainty about what, where the head of that and where that was heading. We knew that there was some likely increase in, in utility costs coming, but when that was going to hit us, we didn't know really until it hit sort of April, May, when, when the, um, the wholesale prices just shot up through the roof. The, the, to the final impact of that, as, as Ivan, Ivan explained in his... his um, his presentation wasn't really understood until September, at which time the, the decisions were taken to, to you know, to, to, to sort of look at the closures as, as an option. Um, in terms, sorry, what was the, the, the second part of your question? Yeah, okay, so um, in terms in terms of the the, the the reporting procedure, it works through that. So that it works through those those daily and, and, and quarterly relationships at both an operational level, um, through um, uh, sort of our, our our more junior officers up to the head of service, and then myself. In terms of the break clause that you mentioned, now um, they, uh, um, Freedom Leisure don't have a lease. The lease sits with Rother District Council. They have a management contract until 2026. So they manage they, they, they manage it with certain responsibilities regarding the maintenance, upkeep, and so on and so forth. Our lease with East Sussex County Council um, is, uh, ends in 2026 uh, at the same time as the management contract. So at the moment, that's, that's the position. We don't, I, I mean, in terms of the specifics about breaks within the management contract, I don't know. I'd have to come back to you on that. Sorry for speaking again. Um, but can, you, can we ask questions of what has been given to the people then to assist them in the period of closure to, to actually get into other facilities? Uh, Thank you, Chairman. It, it, it's actually, um, we, we had a discussion recently um, to, to address that, that exact thing because what we're saying is is it's, it is very difficult. So if I may go back a stage to your point, it's one of these things Councillor John Barnes said about 
where you get investment is required in one area, but yet the benefit actually occurs in another area of the public sector. The, they, the uh, teaching kids to squ swim is a classic example of about where it's a legal requirement on the school, it is not a legal requirement on the council to provide swimming pools. Yeah, but so there's a, there's a bit of a dichotomy there. So what we are doing, and, and, and I think um, Councillor Barnes has, has talked about it in terms of the, uh, the health and well-being um, group that, that, that he is an observer on, but we have talked about what well, do we need to look at? Is there something that could be done to say, from a public health point of view, improve transport links so that children could get to swimming pools a little bit more effectively? And that, that's, that's an area that we had a discussion Ivan was in a meeting with myself on, on Friday where we, we, we've raised that as an issue um, and we need to pursue that because you know, I'm very firmly of the view and I, I don't need to be convinced about public health. I was an environmental health officer you know, when, when, when I started so I know all about public health. You know, there is no doubt that swimming is an important part of what people need to do don't need to be convinced of the dangers of drowning. Um, you know, I've seen that and I've seen that at, um, at, uh, at, at Canberra and we see it around our coasts and we see it over the summer actually in, in lakes and reservoirs where people just you know, go in. So we know all of that. So what we need to do is, you know, whether it be for the short term but even, even if it's for the longer term, is if it's about at the minute getting kids to another um, pool, but it might be needed to extend that into bringing people into the rye pool so that we do it more effectively. So it is being discussed, Mr Mayor, I can assure you, and it's not something we will let go. Sorry. What I have to say is that there, there's some, there are some uh, questions to how we, we cope with the people at the moment in rye, but I have to say with uh, the town and the council are 100% to getting this pool back open as in the earliest possible time. There is no way we want transport created so that that then says, well, you don't need a pool in Rye because now you can all get to Bexhill or whatever. We, we need our centre back and everybody in the room behind me are here for that purpose. And I thank you all for listening and let's work together as teams to make this happen. And we're fully... Uh, on board for that. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, Hazel, Councillor Timpey, you're the portfolio holder. Do you want to say anything or you want to keep your head down? <laughs> Jeez, thank you very much. <laughs> um, well, uh, I think Ivan's pretty much covered everything and, um, you know, like everybody else, I like to see the pool open, um, whether that's realistic or not. Um, I really, I don't know because of the government's, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. And I, I think that's the key. Um, but working together, obviously, everybody wants to do that. Um, and it's, it's just really unfortunate where we are at the moment. But going back to um, Councillor Maynard's <coughs> um, statement about everything was done in private, um, it was an operational decision, wasn't it? Um, and done very, very quickly because of the urgency um, of the situation, as I understood it. Is that correct, Malcolm? Yeah, yes, it, it is correct. I mean, it, from my perspective, there was, um, there was a danger that, um, that we would lose all the leisure centres and, and all the leisure facilities, so we needed to take an urgent decision. Um, what, I, what I would wholeheartedly agree with is that whatever happens out of this, it needs a report back to the members so that they can make an informed decision about taking forward. But I do need to sort of caution that with the pressures that are put on, on our budget. But that's why, again, without I, I do try and remain the eternal optimist, even in the face of all evidence, to say you're being silly. But you know, I do firmly believe that if people work together, they can achieve more than the sum of the parts. And that's what I think we need to do. And we need to look at the operating model. We need to look at all that side of things so that we, we, we make sure that we've covered, I think I used the expression once, in the, that we've left no stone unturned in our, in our quest to get this back open again. I think... Um, I, I, I 
take, yeah, I'm, I'm just sort of conscious of time. I don't want to speed things along, but i just just conscious of the time. So if I take uh, Councillor Stevens as a local board member and then Councillor Coleman, and then we'll see if we can sort of come up with something. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to say, like, I sit on the outside body for the Freedom Leisure. I haven't been to any meetings, and I wasn't aware of the closure at all. I mean, I'm the ward member. Surely I should have been in on some of the meetings or known. And, I mean, people in Rye was really upset with me, thinking I hadn't told them. It was kept secret. So, you know, I just want to point that out. And we do need our pool open. The schools use it. There's deaths in Canberra. And we don't want to travel. We're meant to be getting environmentally friendly. Thank you. I'm also on the joint user group as well. But um, I know there's a meeting soon. I, I, I haven't had one for, for, for ages. Not that I've been invited to. Um, but I had an email come recently. I, I think the date's changed or the time's changed a couple of three times. I could probably find it on my machine somewhere. But there is one coming up soon. Um, no, I haven't. No, I haven't had. No, I haven't been to one for years. I've never had an invite. Uh, this is the first one for, for some considerable time. Um, what did I say? Councillor Coleman. Thank you, Chair. I mean, this all this all just feels very familiar to me. I think it, whether it's sort of libraries, short sure start centres, or indeed swimming pools, uh, we, we've just seen closure and closure and threats of closure since sort of 2010 onwards. And I think the pandemic, the war in Ukraine, the crash of the pound has all just made that, that worse. Um, and I, th I think government do play a, play, play a part in that, as, as we heard from Ivan. And I think one of our um, recommendations forward from this may well be for the council to write to our MPs to affirm our position and our desire as a council to see a resolution to this matter and to add our voice to that, that chorus of support. Because it definitely feels, to me at least, uh, like the, the government aren't stepping in and providing the financial support needed and expecting local councils to, to take up that burden, which, for me at least, I, I think council tax is a less fair tax system than the taxes that the government get, uh, and I think local councils are already struggling, and it puts us in an impossible position. It puts contractors like Freedom in a, in a hard position as well, uh, and I think really government need to step up uh, and play their part in this matter, um, because all I heard through Ivan's presentation again and again was that the support from government is not there, or it's uncertain, or it's not enough, or it's too blunt, uh, and our MPs are the ones with, with the sort of the power to to actually make those big changes. And um, the other thing I wanted to possibly ask um, Ivan, uh, I, I was glad to hear about the sort of salary cuts from the top uh, and things happening from the top in terms of management. Um, but I am very concerned, and as I'm sure others are, about the the loss of hours for for members of staff who work at Freedom over, over the time that the pool's closed. Uh, I wondered if there was any more detail Ivan could give on that and anything Freedom's doing to sort of support their staff who maybe haven't got the hours that they would have been expecting over the Christmas period. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. H happy to answer and, um, and, and happy to, um, to say that it was absolutely the right thing to do for there to be a, a reduction in senior pay. So... Uh, plus, plus, no, no one's ever happy for that, but uh, it, it, it was absolutely the right thing to do. Um, I, I, I guess to kind of put the the overall context, um, and uh, in, in a public meeting, I'm not going to give too much details on this, as, as you'll understand. But if you just reflect back on what I said, that pressure was that extra million pound a month. Reflect on what the, the, the levels of surplus that I said we make. As, a, as an organisation in good times, as a charitable trust, and, and therefore they are relatively slight, you'll see the um, financial, huge financial challenge uh, that we're facing. So I'm afraid I can't give you anything terribly positive in terms of the support we've been able to provide to staff whose hours have been reduced, because what I have to say is that we're undergoing a very significant um, uh, restructuring of staffing costs across the whole organisation. So um, 
Sorry, I can't give you assurance on that, but I, I just think it's it's right and appropriate, with the caveats of not saying too much, uh, that that, uh, that uh, this really is a huge financial challenge for us and for, for the sector, and therefore we're doing everything we need to do to make it work, principally because we absolutely believe in the services we deliver. So, you know, I kind of want to circle this all the way back. You know, as everyone keeps on saying, they want right all open. We didn't come in, I know, we don't run Freedom Leisure as a not-for-profit charity that only delivers community leisure services. We don't run it to close facilities. We absolutely would want that facility open. I just hope I've been realistic and open with you tonight about the huge challenges in doing that. So, Apologies, I hope I didn't get too, too, too downbeat at the end. Um, I, I'm, I'm just going to take Councillor Madeley, I think, and, and then and then I think I think we we'll sort of see if we can get a way forward and, and wrap it up. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, this may be a question I'm asking of uh, the Rye Mayor. Um, do Rye pay a precept towards the running of the pool? No. Except, except for council tax, I suppose, which then everybody pays that. Um, I, I think I think we need to. Do we need to come up with something? It would be nice to come up with something after our um, three quarters. It would be nice to come up with something that we can put in the cabinet. I think the feeling is, you know, I think the feeling is uh, the officers know we want it open. Us, uh, we as councillors, want it open. Um, the residents want it open. The town council wants it open. Freedom Leisure wants it open. We, we've just got to find find some way. Councillor Maynard, have you got Chairman, the answer? If I may, I think that the whole purpose of inviting Freedom Leisure was so that we could have clear and absolute clarity, both in terms of the time scales in, in, in coming to this decision, the challenges they face, obviously the operational challenges they face, long term resilience. There are a number of reasons why we as councillors wanted Freedom of Leisure to come along. I think, quite frankly, uh, it, it is that collegiate approach that we need to see in taking the matter forward and, you know, the absolute commitment to reopening this pool and that this isn't the thin end of the wedge because, quite clearly, um, people in Rye and, indeed, the surrounding area really value that pool and we, we owe it to the residents of Rye and the surrounding areas to make sure that that pool is opened again next year, and we just need to all work in a clean. I think for us to come up with um, a long-winded suggestion to Cabinet, I don't think actually serves to do anything, because we are where we are. And I have to say, and I would say this quite bluntly, you know, the blame game that's been going around in social media is not helpful at all. What is helpful is actually trying to get to a resolution with sensible and pragmatic suggestions that actually lead to long-term resilience of that pool. What isn't helpful is the constant he said, she said that you see on social media that there's nobody any service whatsoever. What we want to see is the leisure facilities that are available for people in Rother, whether it be in Rye or in Bexhill, we want to see them open. It's as simple and as straightforward as that, Chairman. I think it's probably worth mentioning that the Council currently have a public consultation on leisure centre uh, and, and their use. So, so anybody sees that on the my alerts, make sure and get it filled in. Um, I've got here a couple of points here. Um, continue to work with Freedom Leisure and Right Hand Council to explore all options, which would seem an obvious thing, uh, and report early in the new year options and financial implications. I don't think, to be honest, there's any more we can we can do. Um, you know, I'd love to be able to write a check out and say get it going next Monday, but it's not as simple as that. Um, Mr Mayor, you want to finish off? Uh, very quickly, Mr Chair, thank you. Uh, just from uh, Freedom Leisure, really, just to... We know where the situation we're in at the moment. Can we guarantee that the dry side will continue and you will help continue to promote the dry side and get the facilities to a standard where people actually enjoy coming along there and, and use the place, even though the pool is closed up to the beginning of the new year. 
That's a really simple one to answer. Um, absolutely. What, why wouldn't we? We absolutely want to optimise the performance of that dry centre. We're under, as I said, enormous financial pressure. That pressure is relieved by our, by our income exceeding our expenditure wherever possible. And just to give you a little bit of good news on that, and again, Toby, please, please jump in if I get this slightly wrong, but uh, my understanding is that actually our, our, our membership levels uh, since closing the pool have not fallen. We actually feared that they might fall. I think it was an earlier question in terms of sort of what would the, the impact of the pool closing on the rest of the facility. My gut feel was it would have an impact on the rest of the facility. Uh, thus far, we don't believe it has, and, and, and the dry side has, has held up well, to a huge part because of the great work of, from the staff on the ground. And you know, please, again, if there's anything that I'd like to get across here, is, is please let's not be hammering the team on the ground they're doing the absolute best in really difficult circumstances. And I, for one, am actually really proud of the efforts they put in across this very difficult position. Can I just say very, very briefly, Chairman, sorry. Um, I appreciate what you just said there. But the last time we had a meeting, I believe it was a Zoom meeting, about the, the first time we heard about the closure of the pool, it was two weeks later that the dry centre was reduced in its hours. And it was only down to the council and the public that actually came back to you and said, can we have the extra hours, the Sunday football and, and there's a few other items. But we had to have them reinstated. And yes, thank you, you, you reinstated them. But at the time of having our Zoom meeting, we were guaranteed, as best we can, that the dry side would stay as was. And we didn't get that. That was taken away within two weeks. And... Um, and I thank you for reinstating them. Because if you're going to drop it down that quickly, the place has no chance. Thank you. Yeah, I think... Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think I've, I've, I've put a, a little recommendation there, which, I, which hopefully it, you'll all support. Um, if, if that's worthwhile, does someone want to... Want to I'll, I'll, I'll propose it. Does someone want to second it? Councillor Maynard, um, all, those, all those in favour? That's carried, thank you very much. Did you want to drop, drop in quickly? Yeah, if I not could, it's not for me to, to amend your resolutions. That's certainly far, far beyond my pay grade, isn't it? But I'm going to be cheeky because we do have to keep pushing. And I'll come back to, I want to do everything I can. I want to left no stone unturned. Um, Absolutely. One of the things that, when I said, what could you do for us, it was to keep up that political pressure. Um, I'm, apologies, I can't remember the name of the member uh, at the far end of the table. Um, Councillor Coleman, um, I would be, and you can tell me where to go, because it's not for me to amend your resolution, I'd be absolutely delighted if your resolution included that you would write to both of your local MPs making the case for ongoing government support. Councillor Barnes, before you explode. Yes, if we are going to ask the government for support, and I listened to Councillor Coleman uh, with slight anger, uh, because he implied that there was no government support at the moment for business. There is billions of pounds of support for the public and business at the moment. If we're going to be realistic, we have got to be honest, and we've got to admit that what we desperately need is certainty beyond March because we don't know what the successor scheme is going to be. And certainly, again, I think it's quite important uh, to draw attention to the fact that some sectors are much more vulnerable than others because the problem with the scheme as it was originally announced by Liz Truss, uh, was that it was not targeted. And therefore, you've got large subsidies going, in some cases, to industries that don't need it, and in some cases, the people don't need it. That was inevitable, given the urgency of the situation. But what we do need is a targeted scheme from March. We need to draw attention to the vulnerability of this sector, and we need to ask for certainty as soon as possible. 
All of those things seem to be reasonable things to ask. But if we couple it with some kind of political, uh, we shan't get anywhere. Right. Um, well, with that, I can just confirm that the Legislative Advisory Committee meeting that Councillor Stevens and I will be attending is at 11.30 to 1 o'clock uh, on the 8th of December. Um, so I would, I would thank everybody for, their, for coming over from Rye this evening. I'm sorry we can't offer uh, too much for you, but I think you'll, you'll get the message that we're, we're trying. Um, thank you to, uh, to Ivan and his team, Paul and Toby, is it? Yeah, yeah, um, for coming over. Thank you to Mr. And Mr. Mayor. Um, and thank you for your committee for your forbearance. And it's just as well we didn't try and do it last week because we would have still been here at 11 o'clock. So, uh, so with, with that, I'll declare the meeting closed at 26 minutes past 8 according to the 10 o'clock. Thank you very much and thank you, Louise.